Um, it's encouraging for all of us to know that with top-notch science, critical habitats can be restored. Stephen Handel studies the potential to restore native plant communities, adding sustainable ecological services and biodiversity to the landscape. He does this painstakingly, painstakingly diligent work to study pollination, seed dispersal, population growth, ecological genetics, and often working in urban and, healthy, and heavily degraded environments. He's currently the Distinguished Professor of Ecology and Evolution at Rutgers University and a visiting professor of landscape architecture here at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. He's been a professor at Yale University, the University of California, Irvine, and Stockholm University in Sweden. He's been a widely honored as an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow, a fellow for the American Association for Advancement of Science, of the Australian Institute of Biology, and the Explorers Club. He's been recognized by the Society for Ecological Restoration with their highest research honor, the Theodore M. Sperry Award in 2011 for pioneering work in the restoration of urban areas. He's been a lead member of the landscape design team doing ecological restoration in urban areas from sites as diverse as the Fresh Kills Landfill, St. Mary's Astoria, and the Brooklyn Bridge Parks in New York City, the Duke Farms Foundation in New Jersey, to the landscape for the Beijing 2008 Olympic Summer Games. He's received awards from both the American Society of Landscape Architects and from the American Institute of Architects. Stephen Handel is the editor of the journal Ecological Restoration. I should add that his undergraduate studies were at Columbia University, his PhD from Cornell. His research is supported by the National Science Foundation, the EPA, National Park Service, as well as private foundations. I feel grateful that most of Cape Cod still bears no resemblance to the degraded landfill sites which Stephen Handel has transformed into thriving urban parks. APCC is monitoring salt marshes that are still providing critical services, fish runs that are seeing increases of herring by the thousands as tidal creeks are opened up and restored. But there are huge challenges for all of us, posed especially by sea level change we are monitoring on our fragile peninsula. So I'm delighted to present to you Professor Stephen Handel. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you. That was an awfully kind introduction. My kids just think I count plants. They don't think I do anything else. Um, I'm a plant ecologist, as was said, and I've spent my happy career studying how plants grow and spread and reproduce and pollination. And about a dozen years ago, I got interested in the question of can we restore, improve habitats that have been damaged by us? And most of my work has been in urban areas and on the coast. And I'd like to chat with you today specifically about the coast and the challenges, some very sad, that it's facing and what we as ecologists and designers can do. I'm up here at Harvard um, to work with landscape architects. I know something about plants, but it's impossible for me to improve and restore habitats without working with the design professions, the people who have the skills and the license to actually make blueprints. I can't do that. And my job here at, on the faculty is to try to add more ecological ideas, such as I understand them, to the training of our graduate landscape architects. Uh, let's get going here. Um, this is... Uh, the landscape of Cape Cod, the preserved landscape, which many of you here know oh so well. Um, my thesis today is that this landscape is being challenged. Parts of it will be lost. But maybe there's some things we can do to maintain some of the structure and functions that we have today. Oh, it's a beautiful landscape. And of course, it's very, very diverse. Um, when I look at this, based on my training in plant communities, I don't see one habitat. I see many habitats. Uh, of course, in the distance is the ocean and the beaches uh, next to it. But here there's a, a suite of grasslands, shrublands, uh, maritime forests, and some open areas that get disturbed by erosion and occasional storm surges. It's a very complex mosaic of habitats. It's not just the coast. 
Inland from there, of course, as we get to the quiet waters where there are no waves, we get a very different plant and animal community, the salt marsh, dominated up here by Spartina, the most common uh, grass in this habitat, and adjacent upland high marsh with subtly different organisms, both plant and animal. Uh, this is of great joy for the people who live here in Massachusetts, as you all know, not just for the plants, but also for the incredible variety of uh, shore life animals that live in these habitats. The habitats change from time to time, and seasonally, there's always something new to look at, whether it's these uh, striking flowers on beech plum in the earliest part of the spring, to the flowers on beech heather in the summer, to the riot of life that occurs every once in a while if you're there at the right time. Uh, in the high tides in May, for example, is when the horseshoe crabs come ashore and the females lay their eggs, millions of eggs, full of fats for their baby horseshoe crabs. This is a time when, of course, the bird life comes to eat the eggs, much of them, during their migrations north. Uh, many birds eat these eggs. Uh, one of the most interesting animals is this, this one, the red knot. It has one of the longest migrations of any animal on Earth from southern South America up to the tundra. It lays its eggs up in the tundra. And on the way, it stops at these east coast beaches to replenish its energy, double its weight on the eastern marshes from horseshoe crab eggs, and then moves on. This only happens for about a week or two in May. But without this resource of our coast, these birds would die. They would not have enough energy to get to their nesting grounds to keep this cycle of life going. So episodic things on the coast could have great value. And as we go to the coast in different months, we see different stories just like this one. The study of uh, plant communities and plant populations has changed. And we often talk about ecological services these days. Everyone in this community knows that nature is lovely and interesting. And we now talk about it also as useful, important for our civilization and for our way of life. And this has been a revolution of understanding and a revolution for someone like me as a botany ecology professor to explain why my career actually may be of some use. <laughs> Ecological services are many, and I, I will not bore you with a very long list of what they are. We normally divide them into these four quick categories, provisioning the things we get from nature, wood, fruit, saps. Habitat, meaning that the habitats themselves support thousands of animal species, insects, birds, mammals, and so on. Regulating services, meaning that plant communities improve the physical world around us, cleaning, and cleaning the air, making it moister, Binding the soil so it doesn't erode during rainstorms, keeping our rivers and lakes clean. And then finally, cultural, what I think most people think about is nature, the charm and beauty of nature. But there's even more of that. I'll just spend a minute talking about the last two. Uh, regulating services. These are things which are important to us, but they never appear on the Boston or Cambridge city budgets. They're things nature do, and we take it for granted most of the time. Uh, climate, uh, shade trees on your streets, cool the air on your homes and on the street as you take your walks. We don't pay for that air conditioning. Air quality, uh, stopping particulates from going through the air. In the city of New York, they planted a million trees, not to have dicky birds singing in the trees, but because the trees cleaned the air so the pre prevalence of asthma in kids went way down. They saved more in treating asthma of the kids who didn't come to emergency rooms than the cost of planting that million trees. And that's an advantage that keeps up every year. Uh, carbon storage, every living green plant sucks carbon dioxide out of the air and spits out oxygen to our benefit. Soil prevention, both building new soil and stopping the good soil we have from polluting our waterways. Uh, pollination, uh, 
agriculture and the growing interest in urban agriculture, we need pollinators. Where do they live? Well, they live in habitats. They don't live in sidewalks. And you can't buy pollinators at Home Depot. They have to be in these habitats. And finally, biocontrol, the beneficial insects and mammals in our habitats, which help support our lifestyle. The bats that eat thousands of insects every night, for example. Cultural services are, again, so valuable, and we sometimes take them for granted. Uh, recreation, using our habitats for walks or strolls or cross-country races. Uh, mental and physical health, the joy and relaxation to get away from it all. To use habitats as a stress reliever. I put a dollar sign there because this really does save us money in health care in many ways, and that should never be forgotten. Uh, tourism, well, good Lord, we're co-sponsored by Cape Cod today. Um, uh, millions of tourists a year, uh, and this drives the local economy. So natural habitats support our economic life. That's also something I never fail to mention to civic leaders and governments. A spiritual experience, almost every major religion has rituals and events which are tied in with nature, uh, special events which use habitat and parts of nature for building a spiritual life, so valuable around the world. Sense of place, the importance of where you live and how proud you are of it. The world is different from place to place. We like our homes, and it's related to the structure of nature. And finally, aesthetics, uh, the use of nature for art, poetry, and design. I suspect many people in this room have taken iPhone pictures of nature, uh, more so than you would of a building facade or a sidewalk. Um, and the aesthetic angle also builds depth to our lives every year. We've enjoyed the coast for a long time. Uh, for many generations, people are drawn to the beach, to the ocean, for enjoyment. Uh, I love this uh, picture 100 years ago, before my time, <laughs> uh, showing a scene which could be repeated today on, on all the beaches here on the East Coast with the somewhat more revealing dress, I suppose. Um, it's a part of our cultural experience and joy. And my job as an ecologist working with designers is how can we keep this kind of experience with us in a time of rapidly changing conditions? The other thing I'll, I'll mention briefly is that when I think about the coast, I don't think about that thin strand where the waves hit sand. I think about the coast as a much broader entity, a much broader habitat which for persistence, sustainability, and health needs input from the sea and from the land. From the sea, nutrients, tides which shape the coast, bring in fresh sand, living things which give, uh, build a food web on the coast, migrations such as that of the red knot I've already mentioned, which are part of the life of the coast, and of course us, the things we do to the coast to damage it or support it, whether it's building jetties and piers or using it for fishing and boating and sitting in the sun and our social and cultural uh, activities and attitudes. We're part of the nature and health of the beach in a wide sense. From the land, of course, comes other resources needed to keep our coastal habitats healthy. Uh, freshwater runoff and nutrients from the mainland also problems like contaminants which damage the potential for biodiversity on the coast. Uh, species that use the inland area for parts of the year or during storms for a refuge. Uh, many species feed on the coast but nest and rest inland. Without a healthy inland, the, we cheapen the biotic nature of our coast. And of course, we are changing that inland area which affects coast mostly in a negative way by building more homes and roads. We bring things to the beach which have various impacts. And uh, we think about the economic drivers. How much money can we make by having a home, a business on the shore where so many hundreds of thousands of people go? So activities from the land and the sea are part of the biology in the broader sense of the coast. 
And we have to look at all of this, not just is the tide high or low this week. From that perspective, uh, something like this, a pitch pine forest on sandy soil a mile inland is part of the coast. This is an area which supplies fresh water that drips into our coastal bays. And this is an area where our bird life hides during storms and hurricanes. Uh, this is needed to keep the full spectrum of populations and coastal communities going. That's the background. But we have some problems. And it's not a happy story, but it falls to me to say it. Uh, our climate is changing. You all know that. Look how warm it's been. Well, yesterday's paper said the Arctic is above freezing this month for the first time in recorded history. Um, this is a simple story that you all know well. The black line shows the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide, which has gone steadily up in the last 140 years. Uh, I looked it up uh, two days ago. It's here, off my chart, uh, 409 parts per million. We're doing great for carbon dioxide uh, production. Uh, and of course, it's a law of physics that as we add carbon dioxide, the temperature goes up. It's not politics. It's not a partisan expression. It's physics. And I are, don't argue with the laws of physics. Right? More carbon dioxide, the Earth gets hotter. Um, this has immediate impacts on all our habitats, including the coast. Uh, I'll just quickly look at the two green graphs on the right. Uh, this is uh, the general habitats uh, in North America uh, now. And this is what it is expected to be with current careful projections 100 years from now. Uh, look at the north. This uh, gray here is the tundra stretching up into Canada and below it the boreal forest. Uh, in the next 80 years, the tundra has failed, except in poor Greenland, and the boreal forest has moved way up around Hudson's Bay and into uh, northern Alaska. Here on the East Coast in Massachusetts, what was our mixed forest of some evergreens and broadleaves uh, is changing in the future. If you look down here, it'll be more like the mid-Atlantic forest, uh, broadleaves. And the evergreens, which get stressed by hot weather in the summer, fade out, and they move up north. So all these bands of vegetation are going to change and the character of life here in New England. It's more than the range limits where major tree and other plant species live. It's the life history and style of plants that change also with a warming climate. Uh, germination. Many seeds need a cold winter before they pop out in the spring. Some species will not be able to germinate if the winters become quite warm. Uh, pollination. You need a matching of flowers and the pollinating insects, mostly bees. They have to have their life cycle at the same time the flowers are available, or else they both die. With the changing climate, we're not sure that the progression of flowering and life histories of pollinators will match up in the future, in which case fewer seeds are made. A, a seed dispersal, again, many of our fleshy fruit get carried by birds, will they be around when the fruit is ripe? And in a warming climate, that fruit might get ripe much earlier. Uh, we're very concerned about pathogens, fungi, pests, insect pests. Uh, their ranges may change quickly, killing off many of the things we take for granted. My agricultural scientist friends are terrified that uh, fungal pests, bacterial pests from the south will move up here, killing off many of the crops upon which everyone in this room depends. Uh, stress, even if plants don't die, they grow slower. They wilt more quickly. They maybe won't make flowers and fruit, changing reproduction for the future. And finally, as the pattern of plant species changes, the community dynamics change. And the communities we think are normal are not present. We have a new mixture of plants making up new communities, and we don't know what that's going to be yet as ranges change. And that gets me back to the coast. With this warming and change in our biota, there's also going to be sea level rise. As ice melts, the oceans rise. 
this has happened throughout geologic history as far back as we can measure. Here in New, in New England, uh, uh, this is a zone of a very, very high hazard because of increasing tides and increasing sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise will affect all coasts really in the world, but we are in a particularly more hazardous place because of a complex of factors, including geologic ones, we were rebounding in certain ways from the old glacier. Uh, I got some data from the city of New York, who is terribly concerned about this, but the story is the same here. This is uh, what we expect in, there are many, many models, but these are the most severe model projections, and I would argue this is the conservative approach we should take. Look at the worst scenario and get ready for that. If we look at the low end of the scenarios, we may get into a lot of trouble and lose billions of dollars. Uh, sea level rise, maybe 31 inches. Uh, temperature rise, 6 degrees Fahrenheit, terrible. Uh, flooding will increase with the higher seas. And what was a 100-year flood will become a 20-year flood, a 5% chance instead of a 1% chance each year. And when we do get a flood, it'll be higher because the seas are higher. 70% increase. This is an economic and social disaster, much less thinking about plants. And it's something, I'm sorry to say, we've got to get used to thinking about. Storms, uh, all of our friends and climate scientists say the prevalence of severe storms and hurricanes will go up because the Caribbean waters are warming. So there's more evaporation, storms become stronger. We had Sandy just, just five years ago, seems like longer. And it covered our whole northeast region from uh, uh, down in the uh, Chesapeake up through New England. Uh, the flooding was enormous, as you all know, with enormous damage and loss of life, alas. Uh, this kind of a storm will be more frequent. It's guaranteed. We don't know when the next storm is, but we know it will happen. Uh, getting it close to home, uh, there have been studies of Boston Harbor. Uh, I work with uh, a wonderful planning and architecture company just here in Waterton, Sasaki, big group of people. And they did a study here for Bo uh, Boston for what your city will look like uh, with a two-foot sea level rise, which is expected in the next 30 years or so. Some of the lowest areas south of the city and up here north of the airport will be uh, covered with water. With a six-foot rise, again, the more severe case, but one that most workers and city planners feel we have to plan for, I mean, look at this. Uh, Harvard's here where the H is. Uh, great parts of uh, Cambridge and Somerville are uh, underwater, and much of the low parts of uh, Boston proper, proper and the Fens and so on are underwater, and also down here, as well as the coastal communities. Uh, this is terrible. But it's something that probably will happen and that urban planners and governments have to plan for. If you add storm surges, the occasional strong storm, to that sea level rise, look what's impacted. Um, your whole civic life gets impacted. Uh, overlaying this with uh, the amount of people who live here, this is a civic disaster, not just a concern for wildflowers and trees. This is something every coastal city has to now deal with, because it will take years to build or plan remedies to deal with this. And of course, many, many uh, engineers and urban planners are dealing with this, many, many different remedies. Some of it's built, whether it's uh, surge barriers or levees or new bulkheads that are higher than the ones around here Boston now, or green infrastructure, as it's called, uh, living shorelines of salt marshes and dunes which absorbs some of the energy of storms and help protect the, our cities and residences behind it. This is a worldwide preoccupation of environmental engineers and planners, and it's happening here too. But let's get back to uh, Cape Cod. Uh, this is the uh, landscape now. And of course, the shape of Cape Cod has changed enormously uh, over the hundreds of years. Uh, the shape of the uh, Provincetown area, the shape of the landscape down here by Chatham and Monomoy. Um, much of this is protected as a national seashore. 
but some of it is heavily populated. Uh, the yellow colors here are where people live. And you see the whole southern coast is our biggest communities, as, as you know, and another population center here. Uh, this uh, great beach is a national seashore and has been left substantially alone under federal law. This is what the Cape looked like 200 years ago. And of course, the diagram is really quite different. The shape of the province down hook, uh, the size of the marshes here on the south near the elbow, and the whole profile of the southern shore. Let me go back one slide here, 200 years ago. So the story is of landscape evolution, of change. Change is normal for our coastal habitats. And with sea level rise, the change is happening more quickly. If you go back even further, the change is dramatic, underscoring the idea that don't think that today's Cape is what it was and will always be. Everything we know is different. The red here shows us today's landscape of the Cape and adjoining mainland. Uh, 12,000 years ago, there was still a large glacier that was melting on North America. So the land is shown here in beige. All of this was above water. And the Cape and the islands were embedded within that landscape. As the glacier melted, uh, the seas rose, meltwater, and uh, the ocean was closer to what is now the Cape and the islands. 8,000 years ago, the islands now appear as separate landforms. And the Cape is not what it is today, but it's getting there. This is the past. And we have to think today about the future. Um, uh, this is a map I found of lands at risk from sea level rise. Everything in uh, red is at risk with one foot of rise. And yellow and orange is at two and three foot of rise. So our big population centers on the south coast are at risk. Provincetown, buy your artwork now before it's too late. And don't buy one that's in watercolor. Um, uh, of course, of the high uh, dunes here and the uh, landform here from the glacier, this uh, much of the living landscape here is still OK, even with three feet of sea level rise. Uh, you've all seen this on the Great Beach, the erosion that occurs every time there's a storm or a very high tide. Uh, the old dune scape gets eroded, and the habitat above it gets destroyed. You can see they're falling down the face. Well, imagine this scene with the ocean six feet higher, and the storm is more frequent. The rate of erosion here destroying this landform goes up, uh, I won't say exponentially, but at an enormous rate. Uh, so the threat here is to the national seashore we love and honor uh, due to sea level rise. And we can't stop the sea. And no one is going to put a concrete or steel wall in front of this on Cape Cod National Seashore. Uh, there's a wonderful children's book called Good Night Cape Cod. It's a takeoff on Good Night Moon. And uh, alas, that may be our future, that much of what we see as habitat and residence and places to go and enjoy ourselves will be underwater and certainly under threat. In addition to our human ecology, our human life, of course, I, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the habitats that must change as the seas rise with a warming climate. Here's a rocking shore, so famous here in New England, uh, a riot of life that changes inch to inch going up. And different species appear depending on how often they're underwater or exposed to the drying air. And it's uh, beautiful and fascinating. And, Every East Coast school has a marine biology department that studies this stuff. Down below, kelps and coral and algae, and mid ranks other um, macroalgae, uh, seaweed species. And you move up to the blue mussel zone and uh, goose, goosehead barnacles. And at the very top, uh, the critters you're most familiar with from walking on the beach, the barnacles and limpets, the, those white specks on the rocks. With sea level rise, the waters rise, and all these zones have to go up. And if the rocks aren't high enough, you're going to lose the barnacles and limpets, because they'll all be underwater. So there's a migration up, and we can't stop that. All of these uh, forces affect life on rocky shores. Every one of them is affected by sea level rise and 
coastal warming and climate warming, uh, where the tides end up in a high tide, how much is dried out or not dried out, higher temperatures with climate change, uh, w less low temperatures in the winter, which affect the pattern of life, and of course, wave energy with increased storm. All of these things will mold new and different intertidal communities on the rocks. The Cape, of course, is not rocky, it's sand. And these natural communities also change with sea level rise. Here's the, the pattern of life on a typical North American east shore. From low marsh, uh, Spartina being the most abundant grass species by far, higher up, which is not always underwater, with different grass and other wildflower species, and then salt-loving shrubs that get flooded regularly, other shrubs that only get flooded occasionally, like bayberry and seaside rose and some of our sumacs, and then finally, protected from episodic flooding and salty soils are our maritime forest, red cedars, pitch pines, and other things. These zones also will be affected as the waters rise, and everything will move up, migrate, if there's room. Um, in cities, of course, we can try to retard erosion uh, by putting in little small bulkheads and structures to keep the soil in place uh, as the tides rise. But of course, can these zones migrate when behind these zones is us? Our sidewalks, roads, homes, factories, power stations, and yuppies jogging. Um, there's no open land here, no open soil for these higher zones to move to. This is civilization up here. We call this problem the coastal squeeze. The coastal squeeze. It doesn't mean smooching on the beach. It means loss of land as the tides rise. Look, if I were standing in the, in the shallow waters near the waves, and you were all on the beach going up to the maritime forest, if the waters rose, the folks in the first few rows would have to leave and go up. You would migrate away from the salt water. And the folks in the middle would migrate back. And the ones in the back that hated getting their feet wet or their roots wet would go to the back wall. But that back wall is a barrier, just like the roads and buildings are on Cape Cod by the roads and in Boston and our big community centers. There's no room for the variety of life in this room, you'd all be squeezed together, and you couldn't all make it. And that's exactly what happens to our urban and suburban coasts near the tide. Plants can move, uh, either by birds or by wind. It's uh, um, hackberry and, and uh, sumacs and bayberry and a, a milkweed there. And they can move pretty well. Uh, this has been studied for a long time by botanists, plant ecologists, and uh, it's a typical slide. You don't have to look at the details, but most seeds fall within 10 meters, 30 feet, of the mother plant. On each of these graphs, the y-axis, the vertical line, is where the mother plant is making the seed. And you see the large majority of seeds uh, stay close to home, tied to mom's apron spring, strings. Uh, a few seeds get further out. They're terribly important because they start new populations elsewhere if there's danger and damage close to the mother plant. But by and large, the story is the large majority of seeds within 25, 30 feet of the mother plant. Of course, that's just seed. They still have to germinate, start to grow, grow up, mature, make new seeds for the next generation. That may take many years. Meanwhile, the tides are rising and storm surges are more frequent. Plant reproduction, seed dispersal, may not be fast enough or far enough, enough to save our coastal species. These are concerns of folks who match up plant ecology parameters with the dynamics of our rising seas. Certain things can be done to save and restore coastal communities. I'll give you a few simple case histories. First, in places where there is no habitat, and efforts have been made to add back which, what was lost a long time ago. Uh, here's a commercial zone. It's in Brooklyn. You see the famous Brooklyn Bridge in the background. And this was a commercial port for hundreds of years. George Washington sailed from here when he lost the Battle of Brooklyn and had to escape to Manhattan. And it's been used for commerce for, since then. 
But that faded in World War II when you know, container ships and were needed. And this is not enough room here for container ships. And there's not enough room on the edge of Brooklyn for railroad sidings and so on. So commercially, this failed. I'm, I don't want to say failed. Commercially, it was outdated. And shipping moved elsewhere where there was more room for modern facilities. And this stayed fallow for decades. Oh, the city would make a few bucks renting parking spaces and warehouse space. But look at this picture. There's nothing alive here. Nothing. What was the magnificent coastal community that Henry Hudson saw in the early 1600s is long gone. Even below the water, there's nothing there. It was graded flat so that the bottoms of first sailing boats and then, then steamships wouldn't be scratched by rocks and so on. What can you do here? Well, uh, the landscape was changed by the city and state into a public park, now called the Brooklyn Bridge Park. The design was uh, led by Michael Van Valkenburg, who uh, is a colleague in the landscape architecture department here at Harvard. And he's sensitive to plants. He likes plants. And the meadows here are species which can tolerate occasional saltwater inundation when there are storms. And there's many, many lovely species that can live there. Uh, along the edge where there was that parking lot and riprap, he said, let's pull out the old fill. He bade a new salt marsh of Spartina where there had not been one for 200 years and made a promenade where the asphalt was and added some coastal woodlots of plants that could tolerate the salty winds which go through the harbor. These are renderings from his uh, studio. And there's a real picture of what it looks like today with Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, lovely coastal species, all put in by the landscape architects working with ecologists. And this pool here is uh, stormwater from the streets of Brooklyn being cleansed by these herbaceous plants in the water. And then this water was used to irrigate, when needed, the plants in the park. It's a huge success ecologically and socially. In a typical summer week, there's hundreds of thousands of people there. They better not step on my plants, though. Uh, so we went from the original landscape of the 16 and early 1700s to commerce, and now back to this, a restoration of some ecological services, and of course, joy to the two and a half million people who live in Brooklyn. Uh, across the river in Manhattan, uh, again, was a commercial zone. This actually was parking uh, for the Bellevue Hospital for decades. And that was changed by the city into another public park. And most of the landscape here are coastal salt-tolerant species. Uh, this very modern uh, snazzy design by Ken Smith, who also is an occasional professor here at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And uh, working with native grasses, wildflowers, you can see the uh, goldenrods here, and coastal salt-tolerant trees. So a restoration of ecological service and a joy to the many people who live and work in downtown New York. Above that, on, on a, uh, a terrace, uh, more of the same. Uh, coastal grasses, black locusts, and so on. Uh, a representation of the natural heritage, the culture, the sense of place that New York's coast once was. Here's another example of a construction that can be sensitive and bring back these natural resources. Um, this is Jamaica Bay near Kennedy Airport, uh, on flights to around the world. And of course, there's a road that goes around this bay, getting a gazillion commuters and people to the airport. Uh, the road had to be rebuilt, because it was old. It was built uh, by Robert Moses in the 30s. Um, and this was an opportunity. This landscape once was all salt marsh. And you see that picture from uh, you know, about 150 years ago. This whole edge of Brooklyn was solid salt marsh. Brooklyn itself was agricultural, it's a famous agricultural area. That's all changed. Uh, in time, people wanted to get to the bay for commerce. And a, uh, a rail line was put in for fishing and oystering. This was a huge oyster fishery until the bay got polluted. Millions of bushels a year. And around the commercial zone, of course, was uh, uh, homes and stores and processing. Eventually, this was all filled in, and there's no salt marsh at all. And that Belt Parkway I just showed you runs in here. Well, when the road was being built, there was an opportunity and also some money, because 
Roads cost so much to rebuild, there was a little left over from landscape. So around the new road, we said, look, instead of the junk that's been there for 50 years, let's bring back some of the natural heritage of species. So you know, some species next to the water, some higher up, listening to that zonation of plant communities. And behind the road, much protected from storm surges, uh, other plant species which rarely get hit by salt water. And it's a rich mix of species that could be and was installed here. Again, an ecological upgrade as well as rebuilding a road which was crummy. Well, what about the future? I mean, that's a, a few nice stories from here and there. But can we do more looking forward knowing that the seas will rise so much? And we started looking closely at this bay. The perimeter of the bay is about 20 miles, 22 miles. It's a big piece of water with the rockaways uh, down at the bottom facing the Atlantic. We looked, where are there salt marshes today? And here and there, there still are some. It's a very shallow bay. We said, what are the lands that are adjacent to salt marsh where those marsh plants could migrate to as the waters rise? And that's what you see here in uh, brown and in purple, land adjacent to salt marsh that could be the home for a natural plant migration. But it's only here and there. And no one's going to allow salt marsh on Kennedy Airport. It, it slows down those planes when they're taken off. Uh, and uh, much of Brooklyn, as you see, I mean, it's built. There's two and a half million people in Brooklyn and uh, about three million here in Queens. Uh, no one's going to say, hi, folks, time to leave. We need room for Handel Spartina grasses. It, it, um, I don't even try that. And we said, well, look, this is some opportunity for maintaining coastal habitats for the really millions of birds that use the bay during migrations. We looked behind it, and we said, there's other lands which have never been branded as habitat that could become habitat. And each little dot here of green and the bigger areas represent landscapes that are mowed lawns and privet hedges and rose bushes that could be coastal habitats, could be part of the Jamaica Bay ecosystem. If we convince people it's worth putting bayberries and rose, seaside rose and amelanchia in on their lawns instead of the traditional horticultural plants, which have trivial ecological value and trivial value for the wildlife, which is the riot of this bay. In other words, we want to tell people, look, you live 10 blocks from the bay, but you're part of the bay ecosystem. And let's express that with beautiful plants not just things which a nerdy professor thinks you should plant here. So it's a good idea, and we've started this outreach public education program, uh, telling people they should think about plants they've never thought about as the coast itself gets destroyed by sea level rise. And of course, the immediate question came up to me is, well, that's a nice idea conceptually, but would the lands back here away from the sandy shore be appropriate for these coastal species? So we did some tests. And around the bay, uh, all corners of the bay, we put in a series of experimental plots of coastal species just to say, would they live away from the actual tidal zone of today? And we did this with some care. Uh, these are the plants we put in. I chose of the huge palette or selection of coastal species the ones that were prettiest, because I want people to care for them. Say, hi, honey, I'm so glad we have seaside goldenrod. It's, it's things that they probably don't even know the name of today instead of petunias. Nothing against petunias. Um, these are the species in English and what, what they look like. And uh, we did a series of plots. We had 10 locations and four of these experimental plots in each location. And it was a schlep and a lot of work. I mean, growing up plants in the greenhouse at the university, uh, planting them out with uh, students. They, they are paid. We pay the students. And, uh, and then measuring and counting to see how do they do? How do they do? Uh, this was how we arrange things. It does, as one of my students say, look like a giant game of twister, where you, you know, put your arms and legs down in different positions. But it's not a game of twister. It's a modern plant ecology experiment. Um, we had four treatments, as in agricultural experiment, really. Two of the plots, we tilled up the land before planting. Two, we didn't. 
And this plot, we weeded regularly. This one, we didn't. Here we weeded regularly. Here we didn't. My point was, what's the cheapest way we can restore native landscapes? I can't tell homeowners or the city of New York, please spend money on wildflowers near the coast instead of hiring daycare teachers and cops. Uh, you have to be practical and pragmatic in restoration ecology, or else you're wasting your time. So what's the cheapest way to restore ecological services in the landscape? And we'll find out. If experiments are a year and a half old at the moment. There's no significant difference in growth and survivorship, which is sort of exciting to me. That means we don't have to till. We don't have to weed. They do fine. These are tough plants, as long as the soil is sand sandy. We'll see what happens in the next two to four years, if that's true. And then I'll go to the mayors of New York and parts of New Jersey and here and say, this is how you can do it without spending much of your precious tax dollar or donations to nonprofits like the association. Uh, next thing we said, well, look, if we leave things alone, maybe the plants will just retreat, move themselves. We don't know this. So we set up some long-term transects, going to the remnant habitats that we still have, laying out lines and recording what plants grow every centimeter along this line, 100, 150 meters. And then we're going to go back in three to five years and say, what has moved? There's occasional storms and high tides. Which plants have died? Which have been able to disperse and get established quickly to stay a step ahead or a few centimeters ahead of the high tide? Some plants may not need intervention by us, ecologists, volunteers, city workers. Uh, other plants may migrate so slowly that we're going to need proactive management to keep them in, in our coastal mix. This is what the habitats look like today. The green end is salt marsh. The red end is uh, upland, maritime forest. And this is what it is today. And five, ten years from now, we'll see. Will this all move up? Will we move some of these habitat, lose some of the habitat types, and then have to think of a new approach? Well, finally, I want to show you some other design um, possibilities for this landscape. Um, instead of just putting sand on the beach that, of course, erodes each year, we looked at things that could be done in uh, barrier islands, ocean, sand, bay, mainland. Uh, headlands, ocean, mainland. Inland bay, water and headland, but away from the waves. There's still sea level rise and storm surge, but no waves, low energy. And of course, there's some very simple solutions to these things. Uh, this I did with landscape architects at the Sasaki Company here in Waterton. A uh, quick example. Here's Asbury Park today. Uh, beach, lakes which are degraded and polluted, and a town. It's uh, Bruce Springsteen's home. We're very proud of that. Uh, what can be done in a, in a situation like this to improve ecological services? Lots of things. Uh, I won't go through all of this. Uh, lakes can be improved. Streets can be made green. I want to just focus in here on the, the, the beach itself, uh, which is of great interest to, to most of us. Uh, this is a typical boardwalk on the East Coast today. Uh, oh, it's good enough for walking and skateboarding, but it's uh, dead to my eye. Uh, usually the beach is graded flat, uh, nothing on it, and they even rake away the rack after the high tides, which makes it neat and clean, but it's terrible for wildlife. The rack contains dead clams and dead fish, and this is what the birds eat. So ecologically, this is a zero. And behind the beach, again, it's graded flat because it's used for parking during busy weekends. Uh, Sasaki said, well, let's, let's do this, working with you. Make the board oak itself more charming, more striking to attract people, and around it, put in uh, restored habitat. Don't grade it flat, undulate it for grasses, other coastal species. Make some low points that pool water, which is good for invertebrates, brings in the shorebirds who hunt there. Behind the boardwalk, berm up the land, put in all those woody species that don't tolerate regular flooding, and suddenly you have a living landscape. And of course, as the wind blows, these fences and these grasses trap sand so the dune goes up and up and up. It protects the city behind it. And here's a, a rendering of what that can look like. A nicer boardwalk and this riot of life in front of the folks walking here. Here's another landscape approach, Barrier Island. Uh, this white line is the 
land today with a three-level rise guaranteed, much of the barrier island disappears. What was narrow becomes a string bean. On the mainland, the salt marshes are gone, and people are just back here. Any homes in here are gone. What could you do in a situation like this? Um, all the beach attractions are at risk. Over a third of the housing units flood. A quarter of the people are at risk. Well, we looked at this and said, well, how can we rearrange things? We never say retreat. Retreat means we've lost, we fell. We use other words, and the word we prefer in this case is rearrangement. Keep everything there, but in different places. Redo the mosaic. And we focused here on an old sand mine which was abandoned. We said, let's make this the new place for the B&Bs, the restaurants, your coastal motels. Have people live here, visit here, and say, hi, honey, let's go to the beach today. You go out to the creek, get on a water taxi, be ferried out here. It takes about eight minutes. Spend your day on the beach, what's left of it, play in the waves, get on your iPhone, say, I need the water taxi, and back you go to your home, which is safe. For business people, for developers, you can build here knowing you're not going to be flooded. It's a good investment. Rebuilding out here after a hurricane or a flood is a bad investment with very high flood insurance. So everything stays here, culture, nature, economy. But it's just not out here. It's 10 minutes away. Uh, this is a, a sketch of how that new arrangement can be when we lose the beach and the coastal marshes. And that gets us to the final case history, which is the inland bay, with this tidal surges but no waves. Here's a, these are poor communities. Everybody thinks if you live near the ocean, you must have a McMansion. It's not true. So many of our coastal communities are poor. This one is called Union Beach. It was devastated during the Sandy and never really recovered. Um, industrial zones, uh, poor housing, and this old industrial lake. This was dug out to get clay for a brick factory that used to be here. And nobody stops at this lake. It's ugly. What could be done here? Well, we use an approach called the habitat engine. This is it today. We said, look, we're going to lose these coastal habitats. Let's get ready for the sea to rise. And we grub out the land, making lower terraces around this lake at different levels and here near the coast. When the sea rises, we're not sure when, we're now ready for the habitats to move. And that's what you see in the last diagram. The salt marshes get reestablished inland. This gets flooded. This is now salty. And there's habitat for birds, fish, invertebrates uh, and around it. The sand we dug out making these terraces becomes berms to help protect these uh, residential communities around us. Habitat engine in the sense that the habitats move. And like a good engine, it pulls along economic opportunity, social life. All three things move together. Uh, this is today, and this is the rendering of what it could look like with a good designer playing a role, not just a guy who can name coastal shrubs. Um, salt water, living landscapes, some charming new facilities to draw in, make these people happier, and draw in some tourist dollars. I don't mind saying that. And here's a rendering of what that could look like instead of the abandoned poor community it is today. Well, those are my examples of how ecologists and landscape architects can work together. This kind of a landscape that we all cherish will change. And we're going to lose it unless we do something proactive. Uh, these are the kinds of lessons I'd like you to keep with you. Uh, the coast is complex. It's not just one kind of habitat. Physical and biological forces design the pattern of life, plants and animals at the shore. The past is not prologue. What we know from our youth and from today will not remain. That's the one thing we know for sure. Uh, climate and sea level rise will make something different in the future, and we can either sit there with our eyes closed or do something to improve it. Uh, where people live, urban uses constrain any natural process. And the only solution is a, a novel partnership of natural scientists and the design professions, two different schools at this great university that have to learn to talk to each other. And the design must help us today for economics 
and also keep the other eye onto the future, which will change. And this is my last slide. It's a, it's a story from antiquity, when I was a graduate student. Um, th there's a story that some of you, I'm sure, know it of uh, Ulysses didn't want to fight in the Trojan War. He, just, he was no fool, as you know. He, he, I don't want to fight. So he tried to make believe he was crazy. To, so the other Greek generals would leave him alone and not ask him to bring his Ithaca armies with him. So he went down to the beach and he started plowing the beach. Isn't that crazy? And of course, he hooked the plow to a horse and an oxen, an even crazier thing to do, because they don't move at the same rate, and so the furrow is not straight. And it's a crazy thing to do, because who would do agriculture or other social activities right at the high tide mark? Well, the other Greek generals weren't fools themselves. They said, Ulysses, maybe he's crazy. Maybe we don't want him in the battle. So they tested him by taking a child and just putting him on the beach to see what Ulysses would do. And Ulysses was not cruel. He pulled up on his team to stop. And they said, aha, he's not crazy. He's just trying to avoid the Trojan War. And they said, OK, Ulysses, get on your boat. Uh, this, to me, is a metaphor for what we do. We do human activity, civilization, right at the shore, which is the worst place to do it because of changing tide levels and storm surges. For us to build more, to rebuild after a hurricane, is as nuts as Ulysses trying to plow in the intertidal. And I hope we change our activities and tell our government officials we need a different future to save what we care for the most. And with that, I'd better stop. Thank you.